أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين It's my pleasure and honor, great honor to be here amongst the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt and lovers of Imam Al Khomeini as a student of the school of Ahlul Bayt who revived and preserved the message of Ahlul Bayt. And when it comes to speaking about these individuals, you can only scratch the surface. And sometimes I tell myself, why even bother? Just give up. Because so many different aspects and facets on one hand. And then each dimension you put your hand on, you just can't do justice to. And this is not exaggeration. You saw in the, in the clips, the millions of people. Why doesn't this, why doesn't this happen for any, anyone else? Millions of people come to, bear, to bid you farewell after you pass away. Imam Khomeini was exceptional. Amongst the exceptional, he was the more exceptional one. And when I was giving thought to this topic that I'm going to speak about, trying to decide what to talk about, and these different aspects, I felt that one of these aspects that's less discussed, and at the same time, is something that is expected of a Hausa student to cover, although as once again I said, justice will never be done, is the fiqh and jurisprudence and faqaha of Imam Al Khomeini rahmatullah You can get technical and use technical language here, but I'm going to try to be more um, understanding for the, the brothers and sisters here. Not only was he a faqih, but the caliber of his fiqh, of his jurisprudence and credibility, the caliber and how important it was for him to be a faqih, to be a jurist, or else this inqilab and this revolution might have never succeeded. They say Imam Khomeini was a complete package, true, he was. Lots of things contributed to him and his charisma and, and people following him. But if you take away this aspect, probably you won't have the same results as Imam Khomeini had. Recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You see brothers and sisters, Imam al-Khumayni he shook the world and changed the world as we know it. He freed the masses. But let's take a step back. I like trying to find the roots of things. Let's take a step back. And I hope I'm, I can, I'm, I'm able to get this across to the brothers and sisters. Imam Khomeini, before he shook and changed the world, he shook and changed fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, what do I mean? Imam Khomeini, we say he shook the world. He did this in the name of Islam, under the banner of Islam. So this is a movement that is in the name of Islam. What does that mean? That means every single step you take has to fall within the framework of Islam because you're doing it under the banner now. Any part of your movement that goes against Islam, that movement will be shut down. People won't follow. Who's going to endanger, put their life in danger for something that's not for Islam? So one, you have to make sure it falls within the Islamic framework. Number two, this isn't your ordinary Islamic precept. This is something that calls for sacrifice, calls for hardship. People's lives will be compromised and put in danger. So this isn't something that has to necessarily only fall under and within the framework of Islam, but more, it has to be seen as an Islamic priority, if not the ultimate priority of Islam. There's more. It's not just falling within the framework and saying, oh, it's halal, inshallah. No, no. This is something Islam has to push for because big stuff is supposed to happen. And that's what brings us to this aspect of Imam Khomeini. Especially if, especially if, your contemporaries might not share the same ideology as you. 
So you are a great faqih, you're a great jurist, but you have people, others, who are also authorities, who are very pure individuals. But they will feel that either this is not something Islamic, or they will feel that it is Islamic, but it's not one of those priorities of Islam. If it happens, alhamdulillah, if it doesn't though, we're not supposed to go after it. And there is a third group that will say, it is a priority, but now is not the time. Now is not the time. So if you are going to have this movement, you're going to make sure, you have to make sure that you won't be neutralized. You yourself have to be up there in caliber in Islamic jurisprudence and fiqh. You have to be an authority as well. And that's what Imam Khomeini was. And this is that aspect that I was talking about. So when I say shaking fiqh, so that you can shake the world, what do I mean? Does it mean that you, have, have, you, you, have, you will have to have studied in the Hawza for a while and so on, have amama and stuff like that? No, no, no. Be a mujtahid, we're getting close. More than that, you have to be such a marja that when they come and arrest you 15, 16 years before the revolution, when they come and arrest you and take you to Tahran to take care of business with you, the maraja across the Shia world and especially in Iran, they will come from Mashhad, Ayatollah Uthma, as Sayyid Hadil Milani, Quddis Asirru. When they arrested Imam Khomeini, he came from Mashhad, they say. That's how high you have to be, or else you will become another, maybe, I don't know. They, they say Nawab al Safavi. He was, he was also a revolutionary, but he was killed. They take him out Khomeini and the maraja, they, there's an outcry. And they say he's a marja, he's an undisputed marja. You can't touch him. Nice try, but you can't touch him. That's what I mean by shaking fist. So you want, you want to be a marja, a high caliber marja. To become a marja, you have to be able to shake fiqh. I'm going to give you an example. Before that example though, let me explain something. So we're living in the 21st century, the era of smartphones. If you want to, in this day and age, you want to shake the market of the, and, and the mobile in, um, cell phone, mobile industry, what do you have to do? You're going to come out with a, a loser phone that can't stand up to the competition, all these companies now. You got to come with something new. You have to break grounds. This is different than 10, 15 years ago when there was no smartphones. Anyone who brought the, the least smartphone would, would take over the market and monopolize the market, right? There's a difference when people have gone into an industry and done work, and then when no, when the ground is, is bare and, and no one has touched it yet. That, keep that in mind. Now, Ayatollah Bujnurdi, I'm mean, tr trying to give you an example of how Imam became a marja because he was able to you know, show himself a little bit that I'm a faqih. Ayatollah Bujnurdi, he says that I have studied under Ayatollah al uzma al khui rahmatullah alayhi for 12 years. I studied, I studied under Imam al Khomeini 14 years. And my father, 16 years under him. That's a lot of years for him to be able to give this statement now. Unfortunately today, if you have a, an account on social media, you're authorized to give an idea and opinion. Alhamdulillah. So, he says, these are my credentials, Ayatollah Burj Nurdi. And keep in mind that I am also, he's saying this, I am a student of the Hausa of Najaf, Ayatollah Burj Nurdi says. I'm not considered a student of the Hausa of Qom. So I should be biased towards Najaf. Because Imam Khomeini wasn't from the Hausa of Najaf. I mean, he, he, he was in, in Iran. Although later when he, he, he went to Najaf, he taught there. But he was, he's known as... Um, one of the ulama of Qom. So, what do you want to tell us, Ayatollah Bujnurdi? I'll read a quote for him. And keep that smartphone thing in mind. Ayatollah Bujnurdi says all of this and then he goes on. He says, but I have to say that Imam Khomeini caused a magnanimous change in the Hawza of Najaf. In all the years of my studies, I have never seen anyone have the precision of Imam Khomeini when it comes to Kitab al-Bay'ah and Kitab al khiyarat which are two fields that everyone, every Hausa student has done comprehensive work and study in. So you want to bring a smartphone out to the public and win the market? When there's other great smartphones out there, you got to break grounds. 
This field, Kitab al this is just an example. Kitab al Bayt, Kitab al Khiarat, these are things that every Hausa student in advanced studies has to study and do comprehensive research in. And as they get higher and higher, they still do work in these fields. Imam Khomeini, he says, he came and his precision was unmatched. And he's saying, I'm a student of Najaf. I should be biased. I shouldn't say this as if. But he says that he's, he's telling us this. He's trying to get this message across to us that, that Imam Khomeini, when it came to the traditional fiqh and faqaha of the Hawza, Imam Khomeini was up there with the rest. And the conclusion I'm trying to draw is that that's one of the things that really contributed. There's other stories about it too. I'll skip because, because of lack of time. About Imam Khomeini's caliber. Okay. So Imam Khomeini, how, how far have we gotten? Imam Khomeini is a high caliber jurist of the Hawza, of his contemporaries. Very good. The traditional Hawza studies. Give us more now. Ayatollah, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, Hafadahullah, he adds here. He says, Imam Khomeini, he didn't just shake fiqh. He wasn't just a marja who shook fiqh. Imam Khomeini freed fiqh. He freed fiqh as if fiqh was tied down over decades and maybe centuries by, by these chains for whatever reason. Imam Khomeini comes and he gets rid of these chains and frees fiqh. But what does it mean to free fiqh? I'll relate a story from Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi. Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, what does he say? He says, Imam Khomeini's greatest service to Shia fiqh, and please brothers and sisters, when you hear fiqh, don't just think ahkam. We're talking about advanced, high level fiqh that changes Islamic thought. He says the greatest service Imam Khomeini did to Shia fiqh was that he proved both in theory and practice that a major portion of fiqh is social political. That's what was chained down over the years. He might have even said that most chapters of fiqh have to do with politics and society. Where, where was all of this over the years? This, is this part of Islam or is it not part of Islam? This is the question. If it is, then where was it? Someone has to free it. He revived, this Ayatollah Misbah saying, he revived at least half of true fiqh and that puts him very high on the list of those who served Islamic fiqh. Half of the precepts of Islam have to do with the individual dimension of life and half are social political. No one would study these fields in the past, he says, or do any research in them. And if you wanted to grow, you have to, be, you have to do research in these fields. But now he says, oh, and he says, let alone actually to think of putting these into practice too. So Imam Khomeini took care of the theoretical first and then he actually put it in practice. Because maybe he thought that this won't happen after him. But now even our children, Ayatollah Masbah says, our children know that the ma these matters are wajib the same way prayer is wajib. Now everyone knows. He says it like this. SubhanAllah. Imam Khomeini did what he did because he was one of the greatest faqihs of his time. Now, when we talk about these things, we were born, well, I was born after the revolution. These clips that we were watching, I remember when I was a little kid in America, we were watching these and I was crying. I didn't know why, because I was a kid. But I knew my parents loved him very much. And this shows the importance of parents and how they raise their kids. But anyway, we, 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 most of us, I see, are young and some of us are, are, the, are the youth of the past. We didn't grow up or we didn't really get a feel of the context that this revolution, fiqhi revolution of Imam Khomeini took place. We don't know what the context was. We were born and now we see that, okay, this happened, we feel like it will always happen. And this doesn't, this doesn't allow us to appreciate the significance of what happened. So let's talk about the context a little bit. What was it like before this revolution in fiqh happened? Let's not even talk about the revolution of, of, of 1979. The context is interesting now. I'll give a couple of examples and wrap up. One example is, once again, from Ayatollah Misbah. He says, I've been in the Hawza for 65 years. 
a good cleric back then, before the revolution, in those days was one who would draw his cloak over his head outside when he would go, had nothing to do with anyone, would maybe lead some prayers, you know, take part in the burial of the deceased, and was pious, etc. That's, 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 that was the definition of a very good alim, a good cleric. If this person was to get involved in anything that had to do with politics, it would be frowned upon. And then Ayatollah Miswa says something nice here. He says, the Ayatollah Kashanis were no less faqihs than their contemporaries. But they got involved with what was going on around them. All of a sudden, they lost their credibility. He says it. I'm not saying it. In Iran, back then, Ayatollah Kashani got involved. What happened? All of a sudden, he's looked down upon. He's frowned upon. What he's doing is frowned upon. He loses credibility. This is, in point, this is the context we're talking about. Ayatollah Na'ini. Now the ulama here know Ayatollah Na'ini. He's not your normal great. He's a great of the greats. Many of the great ulama we have today, directly or indirectly, have studied under the great Mirza and Na'ini. Great. He was huge during his time. The Hawza was. But what happened? Those of you who have heard of the constitutional revolution in Iran, the Mashrute. What happened was, he wrote a book. He wrote a book, Tanbihul Ummah wa Tanzihul Millah. This book was on, it was a fiqhi book, they say, but was on, it had to do with politics and what was going on in those days. It had an effect on that. What happens? They made him pay. Who made him pay? Not the enemies of Islam. They say the Hawza gave him such a hard time that then, this is like maybe around 100 years ago, that he was forced, he reached the point where he would borrow money, pay others to go and collect his books from amongst the people so that these, these books, have, aren't, there's no, no one has access to them anymore. That's how, what, what a hard time they gave him. This is the, the great marja of his time. From a fiqhi perspective, he might stand out more than Imam Khomeini even. That's how great he was. The Ustad of Ayatollah Khui, Ayatollah Bahjat had, had some years under him, etc. This is what we're, this is how it looks like. Ayatollah Izzuddin Zanjani also, he says some interesting and kind of funny things about then and the context then. He says the fiqhi situation back then was so bad and so blurred, the ulama couldn't tell right from wrong properly. Example, he gives us an example. The senior scholar of the Hawza. He says they would go to some of these alims back then in Iran during Reza Shah's time, the father of this last Shah. And they would uh, complain about the, how bad the situation is and, and things like that. This alim, he says, would turn back, tell us, please don't backbite in my presence. Who am I backbiting? The Shah, Reza Shah, you're backbiting him. This is an alim. You can't even talk about the tyrants? You know, the only thing that's left for them to say maybe is like, don't talk behind Yazid's back. Might be backbiting. The tyrants of the time, you can't say anything about them, let alone talk about politics and stuff? No way, don't even talk about that. You're not even supposed to backbite the tyrants. This is why all of us know that sometimes backbiting is wajib. Those who are tyrants, you have to speak behind them. You have to uh, make the people aware of what's going on, etc. But this is how sad the situation is that he can't even tell this difference. Prioritize properly. And another example, I'll try to end with this. This same Ayatollah Zanjani, he says, one of my father's friends once, he wanted to do me a favor. He was very close to my father and I went. He said, there's this majlis, it was Muharram. There's this majlis I want you to come to. The lecturer is this and that and so everything you want to know, you know? All the good stuff. So he says, on Ashura, I went to the majlis. I sat down, this lecturer went up the member. He began speaking, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The situation is bad. It couldn't be worse. These are our youth. This is Islam going down the drain and out the window. Go went on and on and on about how bad it was. Ayatollah Zanjali says, I got happy. I was like, wow, look, a difference. We see a difference from us. Alhamdulillah. 
Let's see, let's, let's go to the end of this speech, let's see what happens. This great speaker and lecturer, and this shows that it's not always about lecturing, brothers and sisters. This great lecturer, when he wants to express his opinion on why the situation is this bad, what does he say? He says, the reason behind all of these problems that we're having religiously, uh, I don't, I don't believe it, but this is Ayatollah Zanjani saying it. The problem is that we are eating with spoons. Spoons are an innovation. Really? He says, I got so hyped up when I was hearing this, the lecture, when I was ready to just, you know, fly to the moon when he was reaching that pinnacle of his speech. All of a sudden he says, spoons, I just came back down to earth. And went underground. Really? And then this speaker, he says, and he, point, he said he pointed to the scholars sitting in the majlis. He said, to make things worse, even these scholars eat from spoons. This is the context. This is how the minds were, brothers and sisters. It's only if we pay attention to the context, the circumstances, we can appreciate what Imam Khomeini did. His revolution in fiqh. He freed fiqh. These chains were tying fiqh down. He freed him. That's why Ayatollah Jawad Yawmani, I'll end with this line. He said that the fiqh over the centuries was a fiqh that guaranteed freedom from the hellfire. Freedom and salvation in the hereafter. But the fiqh Imam Khomeini brought to us and gave us was a fiqh that guaranteed freedom and salvation of akhirah but at the same time guaranteed freedom of this life and that's part of Islam and that's why Imam Khomeini he embraced all the hardship and sacrifices put, a, put all the fear and everything aside for this mission الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ حَسِيبًا غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَنَا وَلَكُمُ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ